Hey, this is Pastor Jeff, and I am at New Covenant Christian School utilizing my um, whiteboard and projector here so that I can be on the same level as the PowerPoint. Today we're going to continue our discussion of what is the Bible and why should I trust it. Last week we began to talk about inerrancy, and inerrancy means that the Bible is without error in light of the accepted standards of the times in which they were written and the type of literature we, it represents. So we talked about the standards of ancient Near Eastern writing and first century Palestinian writing last week. So we won't cover those today. We probably will touch on them a little bit with what we talk about today with Gospels. But for the most part today, we want to talk about genre. Every book of the Bible has a specific genre that it falls into. And it's up to us to figure out what is that genre and how do we understand how to interpret things based on its different genre. Well, maybe we should first ask, well, what is genre to begin with? Okay, well, the best way to talk about genre is to talk about movies. So, uh, let's just go straight to movies. Alright, so I have about six movies up here, and my thing's a little bit off. I'll twist it around. There we go. So, we have six types of movies. We have The Avengers, Tombstone, Dumb and Dumber, The Invisible Man, Megamind, and 13 Going on 30. Each of these movies rep represents a different type of genre. So we have action, western, comedy, chick flick, kids movie, and a horror movie, even though it's not really scary. It's, it is more funny than it is scary. It's one of my favorite, favorite movies. Second favorite movie, by the way. Anyway, I digress. Each of these movies has a different genre that it represents. And within those genres, they have different rules. So, for example, um, and I talked about this a little bit last week, if, we, if I was going to go on a date with my wife to watch 13 Going on 30, um, and she knows what kind of movie this is, just kind of by looking at the poster, she's got an idea. Now, let's imagine halfway through that movie, evil robots from the future step into the present reality and start shooting people, and they're going on a quest to um, destroy people in the past who will affect the future. At some point, my wife is going to say, this is the dumbest movie I've ever seen. Now, the reason she, she would say that is because the, the rules of that genre have been broken. It is no longer a chick flick. It is actually some kind of action movie. I'm just going to push one button real quick. Okay. So, same thing. Let's say we go into a comedy expecting to laugh really hard, and we know the rules of comedy. There's probably going to be some crude humor, some fart jokes, some stupid jokes, some guys doing stupid things that we would never do, but secretly we still think it's funny. But let's say we go into this movie, and let's pretend that this is one of the saddest movies we've ever seen, and there's no laughter at all. We would say that's the worst movie we've ever watched. Well, it probably isn't. The reason we would say it's bad is because it broke the rules of that genre. Or if we went to watch a kid's movie and it used vulgar language and it had R-rated language and there was inappropriate scenes for kids and it showed characters doing things that no one should do, let alone exposing kids to it, we'd say, this broke the rules. This is a kid's movie. This is supposed to be lighthearted and fun and, and fancy free. So each movie has different rules it follows. It's the same thing with literature. Each type of literature has certain rules that it follows, and it's up to us to understand those rules and kind of interpret the Bible based on those. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through some biblical genres and talk about rules that we need to understand when translating them, or interpreting them, I'm sorry. So the first genre that we're going to look at is the genre of narrative. This is the easiest one, probably the one that we're most familiar with. Basically, a narrative is a story. Um, so I got a little picture of people reading to little kids stories. We all love stories. And a story or a narrative is basically a sequential story involving plot, settings, and characters. So if you think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, that is a narrative. It's got Goldilocks, Three Bears. Um, what's the setting? A cabin in the woods. What's the plot? A little girl who's hungry and tired and um, just needs to relax and she goes into a bear's house. Most, most people love narratives. Everyone loves a good story. So when we come to the Bible and we see, a, a, we see a narrative, what do we need to understand about it? Well, we need to ask some questions about it. One, every narrative in the Bible is there for a very specific reason. It is there to teach us who God is and teach us what he's done. So when we read a story, we need to ask, what is this story telling me about who God is? 
So if we were to read the story of Jonah by the, or, um, yeah, we, let's use the story of Jonah. That'll work. Um, what is that story teaching us about God? Well, we learn in chapter 1 that God desires to save even the unsavable, the people that, that don't want to be saved. God wants to reach out to them. Um, chapter 2, we see kind of the same thing. When Jonah rebels, God saves his life. And we see Jonah's prayer and God accepting his prayer. In chapter 3, we see that God is willing to spare people who truly repent. In chapter 4, we see that God desires to save the lost. So, um, then we ask the next question. Well, what is this story teaching me about what God has done? And these two questions go hand in hand. And hopefully, at the end of this, we respond to God by worshiping Him. That once we realize that God loves to save people from their sins, we respond with praising Him for doing that. So those are our two questions we ask for narrative. Who is God? What has he done in this story? After that, then we begin to ask questions about the characters in this story. And we talked about this last week, that every character in the Bible is there for one of two reasons. One, they're either there as an example to follow or a caution to avoid. And so we talked last week how some people um, have this overarching blanket statement that if someone is in the Bible, that means their actions are okay. Well, that's actually not the case. Um, and even some of the characters will flip-flop between the two. For example, David. King David starts out as a wonderful example of what it means to follow the Lord. Um, he's described as a man who loves God with all, or a man after God's own heart. However, David does some pretty lousy things towards the end of his life. And so there's a lot of times he is an example to follow. There's a lot of times he's a caution to avoid, though, and we want to be careful and understand which is which, and we wrestle with that and try to figure it out. Someone like Jacob, for example. Jacob starts the Bible story off as a character that we do not want to be like at all. He's a very shady character who's a liar and a con artist. But by the end of the story, he becomes a very powerful example to follow. In fact, um, his namesake will be over all of Israel as kind of this example of what it means to truly follow the Lord and wrestle with the Lord. So these are some basic questions for genre. And I hope you, I'm going to look real close to see how big that is. That should be decent font. So these are questions we ask when we come across a story. Well, let's keep going. The next genre that we're going to talk about is the law. Now, the law is one of my favorite things to talk about. But unfortunately, it's one of those things that is often misconstrued. Um, we look at um, the New Testament and say, well, since the New Testament's here, we can throw out all that Old Testament stuff. And since Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice and priest, and he's created us, the church should be the new temple, there's really no reason to understand any of this stuff at all. I, that couldn't be further from the truth. And so, um, for the law, this is a, a, a quote from Dr. John Oswalt um, from the book called Be Holy. And he tells us what the purpose of the law is. So the law is given by God to reveal his character and the selfish nature of Israel in order to create a cry in the heart for God to radically transform the person into God's own image. That is a mouthful. So let's break it down. So the law is given by God to reveal who he is. So when God says, um, don't kill people, um, we can understand that God values life, that God is the source of all life. When God says, be faithful to your spouse, we can take from that that God is a faithful God. When God says, don't lie about things, we understand that God is honest and God is truth. And so the law teaches us God's character, but it also kind of mirrors against us. It's kind of like, you know, I love to draw. Drawing is one of my favorite things. And sometimes when I feel pretty good about how good my own art is, I'll look at people who are vastly superior to, than I am, and I'll say, oh, wow, boy, that guy's art is so much better than mine. But it, it kind of creates in me a cry to be better. You know, what can I learn from them? And so that's what happens here. When we look at God's character in the Old Testament, or even the New Testament, and we look at our own, it shows us where we fall short. And there's a couple options. Option one is we look at this and say, boy, I can never be like God. I'm just going to give up. Ugh. Why even try? Option two is we say, well, here's God's character. I'm going to try as hard as I can to do good. And you and I both know that the harder we try to do good, the more we typically fail. It's kind of one of those things. How many of you remember as a kid, you said, I'm, I'm never going to be like my mom and dad. Well, 
who are you probably the most like? My wife says to me all the time, it's like, you're just like your dad. And I say, thanks. That's, that's a compliment, dad, if you're listening. Um, anyway, um, the third option is we realize, no, I, I'm not going to give up. And I'm not going to try as hard as I can because I'm just going to mess up worse. I'm going to go to God and say, God, I can't do this on my own. You have to transform me. And so the law shows us who God is, mirrors our own heart of who we are, and it draws us to God so that he can transform us to be like him. That's the purpose of the law. So when we talk about the Old Testament law, and this would be um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, specifically with this, we're talking about that, uh, the ceremonial law code and some of those things. We want to remember this. The Mosaic Covenant is very much associated with Israel's conquest of Canaan. So that means that there's some things you're going to read in those five books that only apply to them going into that land. Also, very closely tied to that is the fact that Israel is going to be a theocentric government. That means that God is their direct king. For us as Americans, we are not a theocentric government. We have a president, we have a congress, we have all these politicians who represent us in our country. Israel wasn't like that. At least not at, at, least not at first they didn't. Or later they'll, be, they'll have an earthly king. But the plan was always to be this theocentric, center, cent, theocentric government where God ruled over them directly. And so some of the rules reflect that. For example, and this is the one that I always give in the book of Exodus. It says that, we, that when you go into the land of Canaan, if you see anyone that commits sorcery and witchcraft, they should be killed. Well, what do we do with that as Christians? Do we follow that? It's in the Bible. Well, no, because one, we do not live in a theocentric government. God is not our direct king. Also, that rule has to do with conquest in Canaan. That's there for a very specific period of time. So when we look at this, this law, this covenant, we realize that in many ways it's no longer a functional covenant. Jesus has fulfilled the covenant for us, and he's given us a new covenant that has been sealed with his own blood. So uh, the Old Testament ceremonial law is no longer applicable to us. And so the idea of the conquest of the land, we do not conquest through war anymore. In fact, when the, Bible, when the New Testament talks about how will Jesus conquer his enemies, it's actually through his death and the death of his people that will conquer his enemies, which is a very interesting way to read the book of Revelation which we won't talk about too much tonight. Um, we don't have a priesthood anymore because Jesus is our high priest. He's the best high priest. His priesthood continues forever, so we don't need one. Um, animal sacrifice. Um, we no longer have to do these. And I always say thank the Lord because I would puke and pass out the first time I tried to kill an animal. And that's because Jesus has fulfilled that. He is the ultimate animal, or he's the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. And so we don't have to do that. He has taken all those things to himself, and he continues to offer those services. Um, so the Old Testament ceremonial law is no longer applicable to us. And this is where we have to be careful. When we look at some of these things, we have to ask, how does the New Testament understand some of these rules? Because the New Testament is going to interpret some of those things for us. For example, in the Old Testament it says, do not steal. But Jesus says, well... It was, or not steal, do not kill. And Jesus is like, that never had to do anything with just not, not murdering people. That has to do with what's in your heart. Don't have an evil, violent heart. Or, you know, this idea of not committing adultery, that speaks more to the idea of having lust in your heart to begin with. And so when we read the Old Testament, we want to carefully and prayerfully, we want the Holy Spirit to guide us. How do we interpret some of these passages in light of Jesus and the New Testament? So let's ask a series of questions. When we read the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and specifically the law code, we want to ask, what does the law mean to those entering the promised land? That's the first question you always ask. What does this mean to the people that it was originally read to? So let's think of a past. Okay, let's go with one. Um, the, the one that says, talks about ox, oxes getting out of your your fence and goring people. Well, what does that mean to people going into the promised land? Well, it probably means that when we begin to establish our houses, that we need to make sure that our animals are very um, well put up so that they can't get out and injure people. Okay. What are the differences between the Israelites then 
and us now? That's a very powerful question. Because we don't live in um, first century Palestine when Jesus lived. We don't live in the desert region of Canaan 3,000 years ago. So what are the differences between them and us? And how does that factor in? Well, one difference is I don't own oxen. I don't have a, a cow that's going to get loose and gore people. Number three, although the law may not be functional, each law does have a principle behind it. And it's our responsibility to ask, what is that principle? So it's probably going to fall in one of these categories. Does it teach us who God is? Does it teach us how to love God? Does it teach us how to love other people? Or does it teach us how to maintain God's creation? So going back to this oxen one, well, it's teaching me that I need to love my neighbor through how my animals treat them. And it's also telling me that I need to be careful um, not to raise violent animals that are going to harm people. Okay. On um, number four, does the New Testament modify or qualify this principle? Well, it kind of does because, you know, the Old Testament specifically says don't have bulls that are going to get loose and, and murder people with their horns. Jesus kind of modifies all that stuff and says, well, just love your neighbor and don't, don't let your animals hurt people. That's irresponsible. So then we ask, well, how do we live this principle? And the principle should be something that we can see in the text. So if I said, if someone came in and said, Jeff, what do we do with this ox command? I would say, well, you know, I think what Jesus is, get, what God is getting at in the Old Testament is just love your neighbor through how your animals will treat them. Oh, well, can you, do you see that in the text when you read that? Does this reflect the idea of loving people? Well, of course it does. You can't love people if your animals are, are mauling them. Oh my word. Is it timeless? Yeah, this command to love people is scattered throughout all Scripture. Does it correspond to the broad theology of all Scripture? Well, all Scripture points to love God, love your neighbor. In fact, 1 John says that's the very first commandment from the very beginning. Um, is it culturally tied? Now, the oxen one is very much culturally tied. That, does, that idea of oxen, does, it doesn't apply to people that live in sky-rise apartments in New York. Unless they get a cow, and I don't, I don't know. But the idea of loving your neighbor through all your animals that you own, that's not culturally tied. That, is, that can be applied across the spectrum. And it would be relevant to both the Old Testament and the New Testament audiences. Oh, I do want to say this. I have little footnotes because this is from a book called Grasping God's Word by J. Scott Duvall and J. Daniel Hayes. I did not come up with all this. I'm not that smart. But um, anyway, let's keep going. We get to the books of poetry, and I had a conversation not too long ago with a friend of mine, and we were talking about Genesis 1 and 2, and we were talking about whether Genesis 1 and 2 is historical, or, well, how did we, I want to be careful how I say this, is it historical and literal, or is it poetic? And one of the things that my friend said, you know, it's interesting that if we were to say that it is poetic, people would be very offended, and the reason is because whether we would admit it or not, we do kind of look at the poetry of the Bible as kind of a lesser um, genre. And we shouldn't do that. That's wrong. So, um, you know, if someone said, I'm going to preach through the Psalms for 20 weeks, we might be like, oh, man, are you serious? But if they said, hey, I'm going to preach through the gospel for 20 weeks, oh, that sounds great. Jesus all the... Well, that reflects in a kind of a bias that we have against poetry. So... We need to understand that poetry in the Bible is just as powerful as the other genres. So poetry is emotionally penned literature that uses figurative language to give praise to God, to groan over injustice, and or to grieve over sin. These are very emotional books, and I hope you get that when you read them. So some of the questions we ask is this. When you read the Psalms, or when you read Job, or Ecclesiastes, or Song of Solomon, um, what emotion is the author trying to convey? And you should get that, and you should understand that. So when David is um, talking about he's so angry that he wishes that God would throw kids against rocks, oh my word, that sounds horrific. Well, it does sound horrific, but what emotion do you sense from David? David is very upset, he's very angry, and very hurt at this moment. And that's what the author is trying to get us to focus on. Next we ask, is the author using a figure of speech? So, especially when you read the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, tons of figures of speech. This lady is so beautiful, 
her hair is like goat hair and her neck looks like a tower. Well, that's not going to get you a date, my friend, in our day and age. But it's a figure of speech that indicates a bunch of things. And it would be up to you and the Holy Spirit to, to interpret what these mean. What is he trying to get at? What did the poem mean for the audience who heard it? So when, when these psalms are written back in the Bible times, how would they have understood these? How would they have looked at them versus how we would look at them today? And what does that mean for us? All right, so let's talk about figures of speech really quick. Um, in Matthew 5, 27 through 30, Jesus tells us that if you're going to sin, you need to stab your, if, you, if you sin with your eyes, you need to stab your eyes out and throw them in the fire. If you sin with your hand, cut your hand off. Whoa, whoa, psycho Jesus. Whoa, what is he getting at with this? And do we take that literally? In Matthew 18, 6 through 7, Jesus is teaching about children. And he says, if you were going to cause a child to fall away from the Lord, it is better for you to take the biggest rock you can find and tie a rope around it, tie a rope around your own neck, go to the, go to the Mediterranean Sea or the Sea of Galilee and push the rock in and let it take you with it. Whoa, whoa, I thought Jesus was happy hippie Jesus who just told us to love everyone. These are some graphic images. Well, of course they're graphic because Jesus wants to burn these images into your mind. He wants you to think over these things. He wants them to stick in your mind. But we need to keep in mind that they're figures of speech. All right, so figures of speech are used to stress something that is extremely important. Um, almost exaggerated language. And you might say, well, that sounds misleading. Well, keep in mind, at the time that Jesus uses this kind of language, all kinds of Jewish rabbis does it, did this. So, does it remember our idea of inerrancy that um, the Bible is without error in light of the accepted standards at the times in which they are written? So this extreme figure of speech was highly accepted at Jesus' time. And they would have understood that. And they would have rolled with them. And like, okay, everyone, everyone uses this to teach. So Jesus is following that style. So let's think about this. Let's say instead Jesus just says, you know, if anything, sin, if anything is causing you to sin, you need to get rid of it. You're going to forget that, aren't you? That's just like reading a bumper sticker. You read it and you don't think about it. You move on, you're done. Or, you know, don't, don't make kids not want to come to church. Okay, another, that's another bumper sticker. That's, some, that's something you see on Facebook that you read and you're like, yeah, I'm going to like that. But then you instantly forget it. These don't stick in your head. And so figures of speech are ways that the author is trying to get an image into your mind. All right? And so when we go back to this, which, which sticks more? The fact that, oh man, sin is so dangerous, I need to cut body, body parts off to not do it? Or just, why don't you just not sin a little bit? Don't sin, that's bad. Okay, well, that doesn't sound powerful. So sometimes these figures of speech are there, are there to really draw, draw us into the text and wrestle with what it means. So in Ecclesiastes, when the author says, all of life under the sun is absolutely meaningless. There's no point. It's like smoke that just disappears. And we're like, wow, that is a powerful statement. All of life is meaningless. Now, I don't think the author would completely agree with that. And even in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, he has little nuances to that. But that phrase itself just kind of stops us and it says, whoa, is this a true statement? Do I feel that way sometimes? And it's drawing us in through its words to wrestle with that meaning and ultimately figure out what the author is getting at. So then we come to wisdom literature, which we've talked about a little bit. These are five books that give instructions for a real practical day-to-day -day life that seeks to know and respect God. Um, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs fall here. And so the first thing we need to keep in mind, and I'm going to try to keep this video at half an hour, and then we'll split it into a second video. Um, we need to keep this in mind. Wisdom literature does not represent promises. I've met some people that when they read one of the Proverbs, they say this is a promise from God that he cannot break. Well, that's not what, that's not, that's not how we understand this genre. You've broken the rules. Um, the law, those have promises in them. The prophets have promises in them. Wisdom literature, not necessarily promises. These are basically God-ordained maxims that the people uh, 
uh, God's people can follow. And usually, um, usually that's how they go. 99% of the time, if you follow these Proverbs, that's exactly what's going to happen. It's the cause and effect of the world that we live in. But not always. And even when you read the Proverbs, you see that dichotomy of ideas. So, I've, I've, man, I should look this up. But there's a, that proverb that says, uh, rebuke a fool and you'll turn him away from error. And then the next proverb says, don't rebuke a fool or else he's going to turn back and attack you. And it's like, whoa, these are two different ideas. Which one's right? Well, they're both right. Because in some cases, if someone does something stupid and you say, hey, cut that out. They're going to listen to you and say, hey, thanks for telling me not to do that. But then there's going to be some times they're like, hey, cut that out. And they're like, why don't you cut that out? Why don't you get out of here, you, you stupid head? And you're like, no, I'm not the stupid head. You are. And he'll say, I know you are, but what am I? And he'll say, I know you are. Anyway, I digress. Wisdom literature is most of the time this will happen, but not always. And it's interesting to note that Job is the very first wisdom literature book there. And Job is the, the exception to that idea. That Job tells us just because you're righteous doesn't mean things are going to go well for you. And I think he's purposely put at the beginning to remind us as we read through the Proverbs and the Psalms that just because we do this doesn't mean it's always going to happen. You know, there's been times in our life, even with our own maxims, the early bird gets the worm. But there are some times when you show up late, you're better off for getting there late than getting there early. So um, just keep that in mind. So when we read through the wisdom literature, we need to understand... How do I understand how this passage fits in the larger story? Wisdom literature is one of the few types of literature that you can't read just chunks by itself. Like when you read through Job or Ecclesiastes or Song of Songs, you can't just jump into the middle of nowhere and just try to gather information. You really need to read those books all the way through and understand them as a whole. We have to ask ourselves again, since it's poetry, what emotion is the author trying to convey? So when we read Job screaming out to God, we don't say, Job, how dare you talk to God like that, you angry little boy. No, we say, wow, he's really upset. Why is, he trying to, why is the author trying to draw me into his anger? Well, probably because we've experienced that type of where we feel like God has turned his back on us. Now, is that correct? Obviously not, but we felt that way before. How can we identify with Job or Solomon or the lovers of Song of Songs? And um, the literature books heavily depend on each other for interpretation. So what that means is, um, again, wisdom literature is so unique that it really, if you only read the book of Job, you're going to come away with maybe a very skeptical view of reality. Or if you only read Ecclesiastes, you might have a very bitter view of the world. Or um, if you just read the Song of Songs, you might come away feeling a little more, <laughs> a little romantic, eh? Well, we don't want you to be that way all the time. So we need to try to let all these books work themselves together. And by reading all the wisdom literature together and keeping them together, it helps us have a well-rounded view of reality. Um, let, let's try to get through prophecy, and then we'll, we'll do a separate video for the New Testament. All right, so prophecy is the sayings of God and His prophets to a nation consumed by idolatry, social injustice, and faking an authentic relationship with God. They call for the people of Israel to return to the law and obey God. So this is the primary purpose of prophecy. Now notice, I don't have anything up here about predicting the future. And you might say, but I thought that's what all prophecy was. Well, it includes that. But predicting the future is still to show God's judgment on idolatry, to show them the punishment for neglecting social justice, and what happens if you fake a relationship with God. And, but the primary purpose of all of those is to ask them, this is the future, maybe it's destructive, you need to return to the law and obey God and get away from that. So let's look at five things we want to keep in mind. One, with prophecy, we always want to ask, when does this fall in Israel's history? And prophecy demands a little bit of work on your and my part because it doesn't often tell us the historical context like Isaiah 6 does in the year that Uzziah died, or King Uzziah died. But sometimes it doesn't tell us that. So we, have to, we do have to sometimes go to extra biblical sources and figure out where does this take place. In the, in the Jewish Old Testament, um, the way they do it is they, uh, they kind of keep the two uh, the prophecy books with the historical books because those two really interlap with each other. Um, 
Next, when we talk about prophecy, we ask, is this talking about the future or the near future or the distant future? Um, I would always say that it always has to do with their near future. Sometimes when we look at prophecy, we want everything to have to do with America. Well, the reality is probably not. All right, it's probably talking about Israel and Babylon and all those different nations that are going on. Um, next, this is a big one. Are you talking about a passage that is extremely unclear to follow? This is huge for prophecy. There's just some places that are hard to understand. And we need to be humble in those passages and say, I just, I don't know what this means. And we need to be cautious listening to anyone that says, I know what this passage means. And if you buy my book, you're going to know what it means too. Well, when he says you need to buy my book to get the truth, that kind of indicates to me that he's less than, anyway, I digress. I digress. Just be careful. All right, three. This is a big one. Are these promises to Israel only, or is this for God's people for all time? And this sometimes can be a little tricky, so that's why we keep these two together. So, for example, Ezekiel 36 talks about God pouring His Holy Spirit out on all people. Is that only for Israel, or is that for all God's people? Well, when it's fulfilled in um, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, that pouring of the Holy Spirit is clearly intended for all people. Um, in fact, we could cross-reference that with Joel chapter 2, which Peter quotes on Pentecost. And so, if it's for all people, the text will usually indicate that it's for all people. But there are some times when it's very specific. Um, so, the questions that we want to ask, what response or change does a prophet's message demand? If God says, I'm going to bring judgment because you're neglecting caring for people, or you're faking worship, or you've turned to idols... What does God say that he's going to do? What does he want them to do? How does he want them to react to that? And then at the bottom, what joy is going to come about if they do turn and return to the Lord? So may, maybe I could add a different question. If they don't turn to the Lord, what are the consequences? If they do, what's the blessings that they'll receive? And one thing we want to keep in mind with prophecy is that the Lord, allow, the Lord gives himself room to change his mind based on their behavior. All right, One of the mistakes that can be made with prophecy is if the Lord says it, he has to do it. Jo or Jonah is a good example. God says, tell them in 40 days I'm going to destroy them because they're evil. He never gives them the option of repenting. He just says, Jonah, go tell them they're destroyed in 40 days. And yet when he goes there, the people repent like crazy. They go overboard with repenting. And God's like, you know, let them live. I like this. I like th This is what everyone should be doing. And we might say, boy, God's a liar. What a, what a dirty double stamp. Well, no, because in prophecy, one of the rules of the genre is that God allows himself to change his mind based on how people respond. And so it's not a hypocrisy. It's not a double standard. It's not um, a falsehood. It's just that is how this, that's how prophecy is to be understood. God declares judgment, and if the people respond by either having an authentic relationship or caring for the people or... Um, turning away from idols, God will refrain from the judgment that he brings, or that he says he'll bring. So with that, we're going to stop for, this is part one, then we're going to look at the New Testament on the next section. So use the bathroom, grab a swig of something to drink, and um, tell a loved one hello, and we'll get back on part two when I get back.